Hello and welcome to my story. I hope you will enjoy it. Harry Potter in the S.O.S. Potter. Author, Daniel, James, Jacob, Larry, Terry, Harry, Harry, Mogul, and Lucent and Black the Seventh, or just Mr. Black, if that name is too long for you. Grinning. Chapter 6, 2 Episodes Complete Words 47,376 MWC. General disclaimer, this story is based on characters and situations, created and owned by J.K. Rowling, various publishers including but not limited to Bloomsbury Books, Scholastic Books and Rinko Books, and Warner Brothers, Incorporated. Ready to roll. No money is being made and no copyright or trademark infringement is intended. I don't own Harry Potter or any of J.K. Rowling's characters nor do I own any of the TV shows, movies or books or other fan fiction stories that episodes could include. I neither earn, receive nor expect any money from this writing. I write only for my own amusement and the amusement or entertainment of any who wish to read this. No one will be paid any money, all fan fiction is freely written and posted publicly, and no copyright infringement is intended by any episode, writers nor are any fan fiction, writers earning or charging any money from these efforts. And now, finally, episode 1, titled What the Hell? Day 1, Phase 1, June 29, 1996, 4.33 AM GMT. It was at the end of Harry's sixth year at Hogwarts. Get Early that morning just before left. dawn, on the same day Harry was to board the Hogwarts Express, later that afternoon at 4.30 p.m. for the journey back to the Dursleys for the summer. Harry had woken up early that morning with a headache when he decided to take a morning walk through the dew-covered grass around the school grounds you in an effort to clear his headache destiny. and think about his life so Your far while simultaneously dreading going back to the Dursleys again. He kept asking himself why he was still going back there as Dumbledore was not there to insist on it as he usually did. However, his brooding was rudely interrupted when suddenly and without any warning, he was enveloped by a whitish, blue beam of glowing light. Then his surroundings seemed to dim out and disappear around him. The next thing he knew, he was quite groggy and secured to a hard metal table with a bright white light shining in his eyes, prompting a bit of squinting as he tried to look around his surroundings. What the hell was Harry's first thought as he began to panic? As he wildly looked around and could see three rather small, strange-looking, bluish-gray, humanoid-type creatures wearing some sort of light bluish garment or bodysuit, standing in front of something like a console of some type. These creatures were motioning with their hands while making some sort of clicking sounds. From Harry's observational but rather groggy point of view, he assumed this was some sort of unfamiliar Five, communication system. Harry noted that these creatures even looked strange to him, who had in the past seen many strange, magical creatures. One of the creatures looked over at the table Harry was secured to. From his rather groggy state he assumed he was meant to be sedated. Feigning unawareness of his surroundings, Harry closed his eyes to narrow slits, but kept one open just enough to see the creatures. He almost gasped out loud when he saw what looked like two large black, almond-shaped eyes and set at an angle on a rather too large head. It was then that Harry's pen took complete hold of him as well as his substantial magic, and then all hell broke loose. Suddenly and without any warning to the creatures, a metallic snapping sound rang out as the fastening securing Harry to the metal table snapped, and a reddish glow dispersed from Harry at light speed abruptness. As Harry dizzily sat up from the table, his wand stringing into his hand with a panicked excitement, he surveyed the room he was in, only to notice the three little bluish gray creatures were down on the floor and seemed to be either out cold or outright dead. Harry slipped off this table and being quite dizzy, he moved slowly over to the creatures to look them over, nudging one with his foot, he came to the conclusion they were quite dead. He began to panic again, but got a grip on himself before he unintentionally destroyed something important. He was wondering why his magic was nearly out of control and felt it was the panic he was experiencing, causing his magic to overreact. He began again in a side, groggy state, to survey his surroundings wondering what the hell happened and where in Merlin's beard he was. It seemed he was in some sort of medical room. Nothing the likes of which he had ever before seen in the hospital wing at Hogwarts or any other hospital he has ever had the misfortune to see the inside of. The room was somewhat triangular, cold grain color, about 8 or 9 meters at its widest, which seemed was a curved wall to his left, with a console of some sort in front of it. Out of the corner of his eye he could see some sort of light yellow, colored pads on the surface of this purplish console with a few, inset, blinking lights, on what Harry thought were some sort of computer consoles. Harry stumbled over to the consoles. In the center of these consoles were what looked like little hand pads, with indentations for five fingers and what Harry thought was supposed to be a thumb. It looked to Harry as though you place your five-fingered hand on the pads to operate the computer consoles. The other odd things he noticed about the hand pads were at the end of each finger placement there were four small, rounded, convex protrusions. 
Still stumble and slightly, he moved over to take a closer look at the creature's hands and noticed these were very strange-looking humanoid-type creatures, indeed having five fingers, the ends of each finger, and four small suction cups, like features. Harry assumed, correctly, that these suction cups were used in some way to operate these computer consoles. Nearly poking his eye out with his wand as he moved his hand to scratch his head at what he is seeing, he was startled by a subtle vibration he could feel under his feet. He realized that wherever he was, the room or whatever it was seemed to be in a subtle motion. He reasoned he was possibly in some sort of moving vehicle. Across this room, on the opposite wall, was another console with another two sets of those yellowish tabs on the surface. Turn left. Behind him on the wall next to the table he had been secured to be several movable extension arms with attachments on the ends of two of them and a bright light on the middle one. To his right the room, narrowed to about three or four meters, with a circular indentation about one and a half meters in diameter and set into the wall. He stumbled his way to the circular part of this narrow wall. As he approached this wall the circular part suddenly opens outward like that of the iris of a standard muggle camera, disappearing into the walls around it. He was startled momentarily, and then peeked out into a circular corridor beyond it, leading to what he assumed was a central core of what he now thought was a circular structure of some sort, with this two meter wide corridor circling the core of the structure. Harry stepped out of this room and ventured to the left down this corridor. Creeping along, hoping for no more surprises, he came across another of those round doorways on his left and cautiously approached it. As with the first one in the medical room, this door also opened in the same way once he was within arm's length of it. As the doorway suddenly peeled back into the wall he leaped into the room with a somersault, coming up in one fluid motion, one still tightly grasped in his right hand, only to find he was alone in what seemed to be some sort of common room or perhaps a dining room as you might find in an average public building. Go straight in the middle off. of this room were three small tables, with one seat at each table. The seats were all back to back as though these creatures did not want to face each other as they consumed their meals. He looked at the far, curved wall noticing another of these consoles in the display on the wall with some sort of small diagrams or perhaps Go language symbols. Off. His curiosity coming to the fore, he pressed his finger onto one of the simple indentations, but nothing happened. He ponders over this a moment, then performed a bit of magic on his left hand, transfiguring it to look like that of the creature's hand, and then tried it again. Much to his surprise, a small container appeared on the left console on a square blue plate as though he had just performed conjuring. This container was filled with some sort of purple, taste-like substance. He sniffs at it cautiously, finding it odorless, he dipped his right index finger in scooping up a small amount of this substance and tasted it. He spat it back out immediately. It was horrible, like cardboard and cement mixed with oil and hair gel. It also left an unpleasant, lasting sensation on his sensitive taste buds. Trying another of the symbols, this time an orange substance appeared. More warily this time, he once again tasted a small portion. He decided this was different, more pleasant, like a combination of apple and cheese on dry toast with a bit of pepper taste thrown in. At least he can eat this, was it thinking at that moment. However, he decides to put that off until he has no choice. He tried one more simple, and much to his surprise, a container of what looked like good old-fashioned regular water appeared on the right side of the console on another bluish, grit-type plate. He tasted this and sure enough it was refined or distilled in some fashion, but still all too good H2O water. He drank every last drop of the container's contents, hoping it would not do him any harm. After a few minutes, where nothing happened, he was satisfied that he could at least find water in this strange place he found himself in. As he turns to leave this room he makes note of the fact that there is nothing else in this rather too large, otherwise empty room or part of the two side walls that he can see anyway. This room seemed somehow too large and empty for just three aliens to dine in. He thought there must be more to this room than he was seeing at that time, but put the thought off for the time being. Being, just make, making a mental note of it. Next, he needed to continue his exploration of this place and hope he didn't come across any more of these creatures. He exited this room, which he had now dubbed the Nutrition Dining Room, making a mental map as he goes. Continuing down this corridor to his left, he came across what could only be a ladder and set into the core wall on his right side. He climbed up one floor, then exited to another, much narrower corridor about one meter wide. As he was creeping left along this corridor, he could hear some whining and beeping sounds. Coming across another of these round doors, only this time, on his right hand side he repeated his last entrance. Once again somersaulting, in a roll and coming up, wand in hand and a stupefy ready to spring from his lips. Again he found no one. He was beginning to think that those three creatures were the only ones in this place. 
This is some sort of control room at the top of the entire structure, a structure he soon realized from a view, out one part of the wall, which was a space vehicle of some kind, for he could see the blue and white sphere of the Earth, in an outside view, from a section of the wall, which appeared to be transparent. He gasped and nearly fell to his knees from vertigo. What the hell, slipped out of his mouth, in a most undignified fashion. Now Harry, was not a stupid person. In his muggle upbringing, he had occasionally watched some sci-fi tell and recognized that he was indeed in some sort of spacecraft, in a high Earth orbit. It was not a hallucination, however much might he have wished it were so. Again he gasps out, what the hell, what the hell, he spun himself around a few times to make sure he was, indeed alone, and to try and take in what he was seeing. He nearly made himself dizzy, okay, from the rotation and grabbed at the console route. to steady his onset of vertigo. After a few minutes of calming his agitated state, he pulled himself together and took better stock of its surroundings. Go straight on. The console he steadied on was nearly a full circle, with only a narrow opening at one part. Looking over top of this console he can see a seating area, in the center of what he was now certain, was a computer console. He reasoned he would be able to sit in that chair but it might be a bit of a tight fit. Re-computing. He also noticed at this point that there were no scenes attaching this chair or the Go console or anything on. else. It was as though everything was molded from a single casting. This control room was smaller than the floor below, basically on top of this central core about 5 meters across, he estimated. Reroute. The ceiling was also lower but curved upwards towards the center to about 3 meters Make in height, containing one single light source in the middle about 2 meters across. This control room looked as though it was meant for only one of those creatures to operate this spacecraft from this one central or control point. The questions now running through Harry's mind were numerous. How in the hell did this craft operate in the first place? What the hell is its power source? What the hell is keeping it here in orbit? Who or what is operating this craft or was it on some sort of autopilot? But foremost, in Mary's mind was, how the hell, do I get out of here and get my feet back, on solid ground? He considered attempting to operate, but he had not had any training in that, and decides he is not going to give that a try and so discarded the idea. No, no, he thought, I mustn't try that. His next thought was, could he somehow figure out how to operate this strange craft and land it? But he reasoned it could take him years to understand the simplest parts of this thing, so he dismissed that thought as well, for the time being anyway. At this point many thoughts are running rampant in his tiny brain. Can I send a patronus to someone for help? Can I magic the ship to land? Can I find some way to communicate with someone? These are just three of the scattered thoughts running at light speed through his ever increasingly paranoid mind. The next thought was the most sensible one yet. Chewing his bottom lip again as he ponders, what could possibly happen next and what the hell am I going to do now? Harry leaned against the console, still chewing his bottom lip, while scratching his head, considering his precarious situation. Turn left, he and then thinking turn thinking logically right. for probably the first time, since he was, Harry napped, on this insane ride. First, he reasoned that he had to explore this craft completely, and locate everything that was here, and then make some attempt at understanding it all. He turns and takes another look around the control room, then decides he was going to call it the bridge, as Turn that was right. probably as accurate as calling it the control room. He was taking lessons from some of the sci-fi tele he had seen in his muggle upbringing. He glanced over at the chair and made a snap decision to try it out. As he lowers himself gently onto this chair, he is panicked once again by the sudden movement of the chair attempting to adjust to his slightly larger frame. What the hell? He stammers out as he jumps a meter in the air. Keep left. He wonders how something that looks and feels like solid, cold, seamless, green metal could alter its structure in such a fashion. He gets a grip on himself again and takes a second go at it. This time he just sits and waits for the chair to adjust to his frame. After this chair settles down, he decided it was indeed a most comfortable chair, conforming to every subtle curve of his short and rather slender frame. He looked over the console in front of him and recognizes the five-fingered hand pads again, but decides not to put his hands on them just yet. He still did not know enough about what might happen when he did that. He got up and looked for the round door, observing that there are three of them exiting from the bridge, and made his way over to one of them, stepping through it as he palmed his wand once again. He made his way over to the ladder, and cautiously descending to the original level, and passed it down to the bottom level of what he now knew was a three-deck spacecraft. 
the middle level is by far the largest, widest and highest level of this craft and realizes it is the main living section, deck, level, floor or whatever to call it. He moves along this narrower corridor, entering another round doorway only, to find a very small empty access room except he could see two smaller, round, door-like panels on the floor about three meters apart. Stepping over to the closest panel, he kneeled down over it, when it suddenly opens, in the same way the other doors operated. He noted that this floor was much thicker than the doorways or upper walls and appeared to be laminated in some way. This floor has a slight vibration but also seemed cushioned in some way. He sticks his head through the opening and is hit with a smell like that of an electrical discharge with some ozone and some other unidentified odors, he guessed. He could feel his hair pull and straight down and felt a slight distortion on his head and face. He could see three large, black cylinders with three spherical and metallic structures hanging from his point of view upside down on a horizontal, pendulum-like assembly attached to a curved quarter moon-shaped object suspended from a point he could not see on the ceiling which happened to be the underside of the floor he was kneeling on. There were small electrical arcs bouncing up, down, back and forth from extensions on the lower spheres to the bottom and back up from one sphere then to another in a consistent, steady pattern. Harry reasoned this was some sort of electrical power source, or perhaps some strange sort of anti-gravity device. He decided it was indeed the power source for this craft, but he instinctively believed he would never understand how it worked. As he stood up, the panel closed up again, as though it sensed his absence. Okay, Harry mentally reviewed, what all do I know about this craft so far? A. There is a one-person control room at the top. B. The middle level is probably the main section for eating, sleeping, medical and whatever I have not yet discovered. And C. The bottom level seems only to contain that strange power source and the access corridor. So on to the middle level again and finish exploring that. He concludes. He walked up the ladder again to the main deck and approached another of those circular doors only to find himself outside the food dispensing room again. He continues left, again down this corridor and stops before this next doorway, can open and begins thinking, again. He makes note of a fact he'd noticed earlier, that this entire craft was seamless in nature, as though built from one single mold, like someone had just poured into the aforementioned mold some liquid substance that cooled into this entire, seamless craft. Astonishing, thought Harry, at such an achievement. But for all the wonders it contained, this craft seems too small to be capable of interplanetary travel, much less interstellar travel. But, what the hell do I know, anyway? Harry incorrectly believes this is some sort of short-range scout or survey craft and feels there must be others like this one than the big, rather unnecessary. Wow, hits him like a hammer and panic, once again, begins to set into his teenage human brain. Great Merlin's ghost. He thought. There must be a... Mothership, that this belongs to somewhere out there, as he continued his unnecessary panic state. A-L-I-E-N-S. M-O-R-E-A-L-I-E-N-S. He thought, as he believes that thought, it sinks into his tiny, primitive, human brain. All that anyone could have heard, if there had been anyone to hear, would have been a muffled thump. As Harry dropped to the floor, his eyes rolling up and back into his head, as his small brain closes Keep down, right. for the moment, and then as he fainted. Right. Most men could, and likely would argue, that men don't faint, they pass out. But that is just Exit. some human, macho right. thinking, and bullshit. The fact is, he fainted. And that's really what you call it. Some Turn unknown left. period of time passed before Harry came back to consciousness in a jolt of panic looking all around for some hidden danger to spring out at him. Keep left. Great fear once and again then gripping him as left. he sat on the floor, propped up against the main floor's wall in the corridor between the food dispensing room and the next room he was about to investigate. His wand was gripped in his hand so tightly the blood temporarily ceased flowing to it, and his mouth was very dry and hanging open, with its face as white as milk. Harry shook his head two or three times, trying to get the blood flowing again and come back to his senses, only to make himself dizzier from his efforts. After a few minutes of collecting himself, he continued down the corridor once again, one clutched tightly in hand, and entered the next of those circular Turn doorways. Back. He decided to play it safe and repeated his drop and roll entrance to find, once again no one else, present. This one, he reasoned, was some sort of machine room, with three square, transparent, box-type placements on each side of this room and two at the back. Each of these transparent boxes had conduits of some sort connecting them all together. On the right side, these boxes were brownish in color. 
On the left side, the three oxes were bluish in color Go and two more, on. one green and one blue ox, against the far wall. The green box had some sort of purple four-handled control mechanism on top and the left or blue one had a purple plate type thing on top. These conduits connecting these together seemed to be passing contents from one to another in a recycling fashion. He could see some kind of materials sloshing around in the brown one and what looked like water in the blue ones. In front of the two at the far wall was another of those consoles with a five-fingered hand pads on top. He reasoned this is some sort of food and water processing or recycling system. Go Moving on, on, he exits this processing room, adding it to his mental map, and continued left down the corridor, once again entering the next room with the same gusto entrance. Again, he found it absent of other creatures. This looks like it could be some kind of crew quarters. There was a vertical cylinder up against the right side wall, about a meter and a half in height, with a rounded, transparent sliding door that opens as Harry approached it. He is perplexed by what it could be, but looks it over carefully, discovering it had a button or switch on the inside and figured it was meant to open the door from the inside. Figuring he could get out after testing that button, he ventured into the cylinder. Once inside he turned to face forward, and the door closed a centimeter from the tip of his nose. A brief moment of panic struck Harry as he seemed to become weightless, just floating off the floor in a standing position, and, once he returned to his senses, came to the conclusion it was some sort of zero-gravity resting or sleeping chamber. Pressing the button to exit, he briefly entertained the thought that it would be quite a comfortable place to sleep once he got used to the zero-gravity effect. Continuing his exploration of his crew quarters, he finds another sliding door in the far left corner of the room and ventured over to it. It also opened as he approached and found what he thought might be some sort of toilet facilities. Yikes! What the hell? He thought as he looks at what might pass for a toilet and cringes at the thought he might know would eventually have to use this thing. It looked more like a saddle you might throw on a small horse or a small creature capable of flight than it did a toilet. It was surrounded by a transparent enclosure and as a panel in front of one part of this saddle type thing with several buttons labeled, again with more of those similar strange symbols Harry had first seen in the food room and other places he noted it throughout this craft. As he looks this thing over, he realized he could not use this thing wearing any clothing as he cannot possibly mount this saddle with his trousers down around his ankles. Shaking his head, he looked at a small opening in the saddle and a short hose type extension with a rather small suction cup type device on the end and cringed again, making a disgusting vocal noise as he kicked at the thing and huffed at it. As he turned to leave, he muttered in a whisper. Not in the seven hells of Voldemort will I ever use that thing. Then it struck him that he hadn't learned to evacuate his body of waste using magic, then huffed again as he kicked at the floor while exiting this room muttering curse words at Hogwarts for its lack of teaching fundamental things like this, instead opting to teach such stupidities as the Jelly Legs Jinx. He noted another of these consoles in a rectangular cabinet on the wall opposite the sleeping or rest chamber. The next two rooms were also the same type of crew quarters, announcing to Harry that there were likely only three crew members on a craft this small. Recalling, he had inadvertently killed these three creatures and had a moment of remorse at having accidentally, in a panic, taken their lives. He idly wondered why his magic did that and why these creatures were not better protected, but figured as he was very groggy at that moment, they probably thought he was unconscious and had lowered whatever shielding they may have had for protection. He decided it was too late to worry about that now. Thinking again of his mental map, he reasoned there were two rooms yet to investigate. He ventured further down this corridor, relaxing a bit as he realized there were no more creatures here to surprise him or he certainly would have come across another one by now. The next room he entered without the usual drop and roll as he was getting a sore back from doing that in any way, his paranoia was somewhat satiated now. Wow what the hell, he exclaimed again. He entered what he thought was a tools or gadgets room. Along the two side walls were cabinets containing all sorts of strange tools, gadgets and devices. Not one of them made any sense to Harry as he looked them over. He opted to choose one that looked somewhat like a muggle flashlight of sorts. It was about 15 centimeters in length, about 4 centimeters in diameter, cylindrical in design, with a rotating head or business end just like that of a flashlight, with three clickable settings. Along the shaft was a single button or switch. The other end had another rotating feature. The device pretty much looked just like an ordinary, everyday flashlight. 
He picked it up and pointed it at the floor, choosing the first setting on the left, and then pushed the button. What the hell, Harry exclaimed while jumping back a step, taking a deep breath again and realizing this was becoming his favorite expression for what he is encountering on this craft. A narrow beam of blue, condensed, laser-like light exited from the business end and Get struck ready. the floor at light speed. Right. He then moved the opposite rotating end and repeated this action. This time the beam widened to about 15 centimeters as it struck the floor turn again. Right, and then okay, turn left. he exclaimed out loud as he realized the other end setting manipulated the diameter turn of the left. beam. He returned the rear setting to its original position, then switched the front setting to the middle position and pressed the button again. This time a white light emitted in a puff of smoke rose from the part of the floor he was aiming at. Okay, that is a stronger setting then. He says out loud again. Now he takes the big plunge and tries the third setting. A beam of red light struck the floor and left a small indentation in the floor about 5 centimeters deep, about 2 centimeters wide, the same size diameter as the beam. He then realized there is another small button on the rear end and pushed this button, a very bright white light emitted once again but did no damage. He rotated the rear end and the beam again widened, up to a meter in diameter. He ran his hand quickly in front of this beam and once again huffed at it while muttering out loud. Great Merlin's whiskers, that's a bloody handy little tool, a three-phased weapon and a high-intensity flashlight too. Harry recognized from his sci-fi teller that this is a weapon, probably with a spin, kills and disintegrates setting based on what he witnessed. He had been wondering how he was going to get rid of these alien creatures' bodies and reason he can probably disintegrate them using this third setting. At least, they won't smell up the place now. This is one thing I want to keep on me now, at all times. He thought. He wanted to try one other thing with his flashlight laser, and that was to see if it would fire while the flashlight part was operating, so set the flashlight on with a 1 meter wide beam and press the cylinder button while on the spin setting and sure enough it worked just the same, only the blue beam was about 5 centimeters wide. As he moves it to put it in his left pocket it attaches itself to his clothing wherever he places it as though it has some sort of built-in static or magnetic sticking charm. Choosing to attach it to his upper left leg, at arm's length and resetting it to the stun position he figured he had another weapon apart from his wand he could now use to protect himself. He had long ago discovered he was ambidextrous in most things and could even write with either hand, although he usually wrote using his right hand and had gotten used to using his wand primarily in that hand. He idly wondered if he could use this weapon on Voldemort to finally get rid of that creature as well, then pondered the prophecy and the power he knows not but dismiss that thought for now, as he was not exactly in a position yet, to execute that thinking. Next on the table, in front of him was some sort of flexible utility belt, about 8 centimeters wide, meant to go around the waist area. Harry thought. Several adjustable controls were on the front, after playing with it for a bit, found that when putting it around the waist, it was somewhat stretchy and fastened in some right. static or magnetic fashion, in the same way the flashlight laser had attached to his clothing. It took a fair amount of pressure to unfasten it. Putting it back on again he began adjusting the controls when suddenly a magnetic shield popped on, engulfing him and conforming to his body size and shape. The shield extended about 10 to 15 centimeters out from his body and kept that distance and configuration as he moved around. He had no problem breathing but felt as though the pressure had changed a little. He pressed the same control again and the shield turned off. He wasn't sure what to make of it at that moment, but his best guess was some sort of atmospheric and pressure shielding device. Again there were those symbols under each control which Harry could not understand or translate. He looked over to the table on his right and there were six light greenish in color fabrics. When Harry put one in his hands to feel the textures, he was quite astonished at what felt like a liquid type fabric substance rather sensual to the touch. He stretched one out and realized it was some kind of clothing or single piece body suit. He was tempted to try one on, but hesitated for a moment when he realized he could not have any other clothing on under this garment and felt a bit embarrassed at having to peel off all his clothing to try this on. After considering this situation for a few minutes and remembering he was alone, he decided to take the proverbial plunge and disrobed all of his clothing. Standing there naked as a newborn baby, he did indeed turn as red, faced as a tomato. He slipped his left, then his right leg into this body suit and began to slide it up his body. The sensations on his sensitive teenage skin were too much for young Harry to control and by the time he got it up as his buttocks his teenage manhood was fully up in the saluting at full attention position. 
his face got even redder as he looked inside the front part of this suit and there was a small opening. He realized he was expected to insert his penis into this opening, as this was some sort of waste removal system, for what he now realized was an environment suit. What the hell? Harry exclaimed out loud. As he pondered this opening, that seemed too small to accommodate his normal man, uh, much less his erection, but maneuvered his erection into this opening anyway, which expanded a bit but was quite tight, Harry thought. That was when it happened. Young Harry lost whatever bit of control he had been maintaining in climax before he could even pull it out, to use his hand as a receiver for his baby batter. Great Merlin's ghost! Harry gasped out as he continued pumping out baby batter up to 10 or 12 pumps as he fell sideways against the table. Well, ooh, eh, eh, if you all you cares, wow, well, now that was intense and quite something else, too. Harry abruptly yelled out. Getting back some control of himself, he idly wondered if this environment suit was supposed to have that kind of effect on him, or if it was just a horny teenager's reaction to the situation and the sensations caused by this fabric. He decided it was the latter, but started to wonder if he was some sort of pervert with an alien fabric fetish for having had that happen. Then gave himself a bit of a shake at the thoughts running amok in his otherwise empty head. It was then he also noted that there was an inner absorption pocket which took all of his baby batter and absorbed it into this inner pocket and disappeared. Well, that seems efficient and quite convenient, too. I hope it doesn't get pregnant as well. Harry muttered in a whisper, simultaneously thinking he could at least avoid that toilet thing for urinating anyway. He idly wondered if the suit had some arrangement for the other waste problem and cringed at the thought of having to, at some point, poop in the suit and figured he would try and avoid that too, if possible. Still a bit red, faced and embarrassed by this experience, he put his own clothing back on, remembering he had discarded his uniform robe back in the medical room when he had arrived in this nightmare situation. He continued to look over some of these gadgets but was a bit afraid to try any more of them. He had been lucky so far, he hadn't blown himself up at every turn in this strange place. He had to find some way to understand what was around him if he ever expected to get the hell out of here. But he was struck with another thought at that moment and that was... Could he make use of this spacecraft? If he was careful he might just get away with that. Between his magic and the craft's own abilities and gadgets, he just might be able to eventually make some use of it, even making it a home. Which would be way better than the Dursleys in, oh so many ways. Well, except for that damn toilet anyway. He hopped again. If he could just get a grip on his panic and begin to understand this craft. It might just work to his great advantage and future benefit. It was time to move on to the next room. Harry had figured it must be the last one, based on the size of this craft. After he finished investigating this next and likely last room, he had to sit down and get a good picture in his head of the layout of the vehicle. Then think up some way to understand it and make use of it. Then he was struck with another thought. What the hell else could possibly happen or potentially go wrong? What we know about Murphy's Law is that if you say it or think it, it will surely happen. Harry moved out of this gadget or tools room and proceeded left again, down the corridor to the final room. Stepping through the round doorway, he was struck with humbleness at the sight that greeted him. For in this room was a similar console to that of the one on the bridge and a display area, displaying an almost full 360 degree view on the walls. There were a few of Earth's many cities and other stellar locations, seemingly on a multitude of viewing screens. It was as though this room was viewing, recording or just displaying places and events taking place on Earth and a few other star systems in what appeared to be real time. After a moment of carefully looking at the displays, then at the computer console again, Harry ventured over to the console chair and seated himself. The chair again adjusted to his frame as the bridge chair had done earlier. Looking at the console in front of him, Harry decided again to take the proverbial plunge and transfigured his both hands to that of the creatures, then placed them on the hand pads. As the ends of its fingers made their way to the protrusions, the suction cup type pads at the end of its fingers stuck to the protrusions and Harry's mind started to fill with new knowledge. Schematic and blueprint type diagrams, maps and stellar cartography first began to siphon off into his brain. Then hundreds of languages, pictographic symbols, subspace wormhole telemetry configurations, hyperspace curves, in space time, magnetic current, multi and subdimensional phase physics flooded Harry's tiny brain. 
and it appeared he had been mistaken in his assumption that this craft was incapable of interstellar travel. This went on for an unknown amount of time, but it was all too much for Harry's brain to assimilate at one time, and Harry was ejected out of the chair, falling unconscious to the floor, face down. It was Harry's magic that ejected him from the chair and saved his life and his brain from frying. It fought back as it did when Harry arrived and released him from the computer interface. Some unknown length of time passed, and then Harry began to return to life with the biggest splitting headache he had ever known. What the hell? Was his first thought as he couldn't recall what had happened or who or where he was. Go straight on. Then slowly, very slowly over the next 10 or 15 minutes he started to remember bits and pieces of what happened as he still sat there on the floor in this room, propped up against the computer console. He was humbled once again at his new thoughts, memories and new knowledge running in his mind. He seemed now to grasp the environment of these aliens, more importantly, right. he seemed to and understand right. now this ship and its functions as though he had always been here. His entire fundamental view of everything changed in that instant. Turn right. His petty fight with Voldemort seemed infantile and utter insignificance compared to the vastness of time and space as he now understood it. Slowly, Harry got to his feet, shaking his head a bit to clear it of some still remaining fog. Harry left this room for now and went back into the last room they had visited, the tools room. This time they had no qualms about the suit or the tools in this room. He disrobed again and dressed in what he now knew with certainty was the environment suit without the previous embarrassment or physical reaction he'd experienced some time earlier. The suit would, in combination with some other tools, right. protect him from extreme heat and cold, right. the vacuum of space, extreme radiation and a multitude of other dangerous and harmful elements and yes indeed, it handled all the turn body's right. waste product by absorption in the form of recycling. He then picked up a utility belt, placed it around his waist. Deciding that redundancy was always going to be a must, in case of lost, stolen or some need for an extra unit, attached to flashlight laser weapons, two portable magnetic teleportation units, and two holographic phased projectors that would surround him with a phased hologram Go that he could adjust on. to appear to others in any manner of descriptions he wished to adjust it to. Harry then went to the computer console and input several beam down and returned to the bridge coordinates for the magnetic teleportation units, then input several additional adjustments for the holographic phase projectors, the environment and atmospheric pressure unit and magnetic shielding that was built into the utility belt. These would give him variable adjustability to environments, pressures and magnetic shielding. All in all, a really great set of tools and equipment. Harry thought. Satisfied he now had all his proverbial ducks in a row. He made those adjustments to one holographic phase projector to appear as he would look normally in his Hogwarts uniform and proceeded to the bridge. Sitting in the bridge chair, he took a moment to enjoy the sensations of the bridge chair adjusting again to his frame and let out a small sigh of satisfaction at how really comfortable this chair was. He placed his hands once again on the console, this time he didn't need to transfigure his hands as he now knew how to manipulate the computers to accept his normal hand configuration in order to operate this spacecraft with an expertise. He had a few minor annoyances to fix on Earth, then he reckoned he would be off on an exciting and dangerous new adventure in space and perhaps time as well. He maneuvered his spacecraft over the Hogwarts school and activated a magnetic cloaking shield that would render his ship invisible, undetectable to radar and other Earth-type sensors, including the Hogwarts wars. He wanted to collect a few earthly belongings, Go say goodbye to a few of his friends, ridders of the past, Voldemort, and be on his way. Just a bit of childish cleanup, he mused. He also realized that this seemed meant to happen according to that prophecy. As he certainly did have a power this Dark Lord knew not. By the time he was hovering over Hogwarts he had also realized he had not been gone for more than six or seven hours, as the train was not yet ready to leave and he had been abducted quite early that morning. So he might not have even been missed by anyone other than perhaps Ron and Hermione. He briefly gave thought to asking Ron and Hermione if they wanted to go on a great adventure with him, but thought better of that after he considered it for a bit. It wouldn't be right, taking either of them away from a loving family, even if they believed him. He couldn't think of anyone else that had so little to lose, so he resigned himself to taking off alone. In Harry's case he had absolutely nothing to lose and no real reason to hang around this corrupt, bigoted magical society which Britain had fostered for centuries. Day 1, June 29, 1996, 12.11 p.m. GMT, Harry teleported onto the third floor and into Moaning Myrtle's haunted washroom. Again, noticing that same whitish blue glowing beam of light. 
he was a bit concerned that the teleport team may have been responsible for his earlier groggy state, but soon realized the alien dad in the first beam up induced a sedative effect, which was meant to keep him unconscious for a time, but that only made him groggy. He peeked out the doorway and found no one around so ventured out. He had also realized he could now feel the school's wards and found them odd, they seemed so primitive to him now. He made his way to Gryffindor Tower, giving the password and entered to Ron and Hermione arguing about, you guessed it. Keep Where could Harry be? He's not been seen left. for hours. Could he have been abducted by you know who? Hermione whispered to Ron just centimeters from his ear. Harry walked in and started to laugh at the absurdity of Hermione's statement. In view of the fact that he had indeed been abducted, but no one would believe him anyway. So he just smiled and said, Hi guys, where have you been all morning? I've been looking for you too, for hours. He could barely keep himself from a belly laugh but managed to maintain a rather wide, face grin at Hermione's exasperated expression. She started to say something but her mouth closed Go and opened and on. closed and opened again, but not a sound squeezed out. Harry walked up to his dorm room and quickly closed and locked the door for about 20 seconds, performed a bit of magic to pack his few earthly belongings, then teleported them to his ship. Quickly then, unlocking the door as they both tumbled into the room, asking questions of Harry at the same time. Harry just ignored their questions and said he was going to talk to a few people before he left. Both Ron and Hermione looked at each other with that, Go what does he mean, on. look on their faces and certainly sensed something was off about Harry, but had no chance to quiz him further as he made his way out of the common room and headed for McGonagall's office. As he was about to knock on the door it opened as Minerva was about to exit. Harry asked for a word with her in private and they went into her office. Harry placed some magic shielding and privacy wards on the door and room and asked her for an oath of silence for what he was about to tell her. After she reluctantly gave her oath and stared at Harry in her usual thin-lipped, stern fashion. Harry explained that he now knew how he was going to rid the magic world of Voldemort and that it would be finished by the end of the day, which he should be hearing about it, tonight or tomorrow. He then informed her, in no uncertain terms, he would not be returning to Hogwarts next year. She of course, asked about this and gave warning about how he must finish his magical education. Harry was adamant that he would not be returning and would speak of it, no further, but that she was not to worry about him that he would be just fine, that his future plans were already set in motion. He informed her that it was not very likely that she would be seeing him again for some time anyway, and that this was probably Go goodbye. She continued to prod him again and Harry just raised his hands in that stop talking motion and said that he was going to finish the job that Elvis seemed to think he was born to do, that when the job was finished, he would not be staying around this corrupt, so-called pure blood in red, bigoted, illogical, magical world any longer than he had to. Go straight he then told on. her to think of him as an extreme traveler who was going on an adventure to see some sights. He left at her tight lipped expression, which just got tighter but he would say no more. She didn't like it one bit, but she was bound by her oath to say nothing about this Keep conversation, left. and Harry left the room left. after surprising her with a big hug, leaving Minerva in a bit of astonishment, and something of a very testy mood. Harry made exit his way back left. to Gryffindor Tower and had much of the same conversation with Ron and Hermione and pleaded with them to ask no more questions. Gave them both big hugs and thanked them for being such good friends over the last six years and said his goodbyes to them as well. He turned away, leaving them in much the same, astonished and very testy frame of mind. He made his way around the room to those who were present and said his goodbyes to them as well, getting the weirdest looks from some of them as though they all seemed to know they would never see Harry again. He peeled away from Gryffindor Tower feeling a bit nostalgic at leaving, but pressed on anyway. As he entered the third floor washroom again, he was just about to teleport to the ship when Dobby popped in front of him and asked. Is Harry Potter leaving for good now? Harry Potter won't be coming back, is that right, Harry Potter? Harry was momentarily stunned by Dobby's appearance, then had a brilliant idea, and asked. Do you want to come with me Dobby and do you know where I am going? Oh yes Harry Potter, Dobby really want to go with Harry Potter and Dobby does not care where Harry Potter going. Dobby knows that Harry Potter go very, very far away and might not ever return but Dobby really, really want to go anywhere that Harry Potter be going now. The statement came from Dobby in the most sincere look and vocal tone Harry had ever seen or heard. Harry asked, Dobby if I told you we were going to travel a very long way into space, would you understand what I meant? Dobby replied with, 
Doggy understands a little about out there and looked up as he said that. But Doggy want to go anywhere that Harry Potter be going now. Doggy want to look after Harry Potter. Harry Potter must not go far away alone. Harry Potter need Doggy, sir. Harry then said one more time. Doggy it will just be the two of us for a very long time, I expect. Are you really sure about this? And Doggy just bobbed his head up and down, ears flapping, in unison with a quick motion of Doggy's head. Very well then, take Keep hold of my hand and don't let go. Be prepared for a big surprise. As they both vanished from the girls' washroom, teleporting to the ship. As they landed on the bridge of the ship, Doggy's eyes got as big as pie plates as he looked around his surroundings and blurted out. What the hell? DDD, does Harry Potter understand how to be working this machine, sir? As Doggy said that he too felt a moment of vertigo and seemed to sway a bit as he also had grabbed for the console to steady himself. Easy there, Doggy, and yes, also, two things straight off, don't touch anything until you too understand what you are doing and secondly, please, please, just call me Harry or you will drive me nuts using my full name all the time. As of right now you are not bound to, or by, any house health laws or earth-related laws, or rules, only to the rules of this ship and well I guess my rules, or in fact orders and those are the first two new rules or orders you will just have to get you to, okay Doggy? Yes Harry, Doggy understands and will obey Harry's orders. Doggy stood stiffly at attention when he said that. Doggy, do you understand that you are not a slave, but a friend, and as such I consider you as equal to me in every way except for perhaps my knowledge of the ship? However, if we are going to function well on this ship there can only be one person in charge and as I understand the ship, then I invited you along with you accepting that will have to be me. But you are not a slave, instead you are a crew member under my command. If I give you an order, you are to carry out that order, not as a slave but as an officer of the ship. Do you understand all that, Dobby? Dobby gulped and tears ran from his big blue eyes as he spoke. Yes, yes I do understand. I have watched some muggle tell and I understand the concept of ship command. Dobby is very happy to be under your command in such a situation and thank you, Harry, sir. Excellent, Dobby, but I am surprised that you have watched muggle tell. I guess there is a lot about ourselves I don't know or understand yet. Perhaps, in time, you will teach me, Dobby? But now for a bit of cleanup to render on this planet before we venture off. Harry muttered. And what be that cleanup, Harry? Dobby asked, more sure of his position now. Ah, that. Well, that would be removing Voldemort as a threat to this world once and for all. Harry replied in a matter-of-fact vocal tone. Harry sat back in the control chair as Dobby watched every move Harry made. Harry maneuvered the ship using his mind's eye, connected through the computer interface and through that damn link from his scar, to find old Voldy at what Harry suspected was the riddle house as he recognized the graveyard he had been in once before, projected on one of the transparent walls. Once he found the brick, he teleported him to the bridge, surrounding him with a magnetic force field, and was sure he heard old Tommy Boy mutter, what the hell. But before the self, Proclaimed Dark Lord Voldemort knew what was happening. Harry had drained off almost every bit of his magic energy and stored it in a magnetic containment field, then siphoning it off into a magnetic storage container for later disposal by teleporting it into the sun's core. Then with a usual witch blue flash and a small bit of flourish on Harry's part, teleported this prick straight into a ministry holding cell on level 9 of the British ministry building. End of phase 1.